great to be back. There's many, many great things about being back in the valley. Um, one of them is not Route 81. <laughs> and how many people think that surgery should be the last absolute result for an orthopedic problem? Good. And if you're unfortunate enough to need surgery, how many would prefer to have that surgery outside of a hospital if they could? Great. So really, that's why we're, that's why we're here tonight. We're going to talk about something called rapid recovery for a total knee replacement. And it's kind of a new concept where if somebody is unfortunate enough to exhaust all their non-operative options and they need surgery, we have a, a, new, a new program, sort of new, that allows them to do it outside of a hospital setting. It's not for everybody, and we're gonna go through those criteria tonight. So we're gonna go over why would we do this, who would we do it on, and how would we do it? So, and why coordinated health? Well, coordinated health is actually the regional leader in joint replacement. Volume matters. You've seen that on signs, you've seen it in healthcare articles. Coordinated Health does more joint replacements than any major hospital system in the Lehigh Valley and the Wyoming Valley. We do more than any other orthopedic group in those two regions. Our hospitals have the highest health grades in PA, and we just got a five-star rating from Medicare Services. And so I've been doing outpatient arthroplasty for 20 years. So how could this be a new procedure if we just said that? But actually what we've been doing is outpatient unicompartmental arthroplasties, outpatient partial knee replacements. And the reason I've, is we came from the sports medicine world, and if you look at athletes that go through life, get injury and have surgery, meniscal surgery, ACL surgery, progressive degenerative diseases, some of them will wear out just part of their knees. So historically, we just assumed that they were an older sports patient, and we would take their knee and treat them like an ACL reconstruction, take them to an ambulatory surgical center, use the same anesthesia, make a small incision and do what's called a partial knee replacement, which is like a partial crown instead of replacing or resurfacing the whole knee. And we've actually been doing that for 20 years. <clears throat> and so we've now just sort of figured out through different surgical techniques how to do a whole knee replacement through the same sort of incision with the same sort of technique. So we have a history of doing this, but the demographics are a little different. If you think of our history of unicompartment arthroplasty, it's more you know, the sports group and the 20, 30, 40 year old group, but the demographics of total joints, although we've done them from 22 to 94, the biggest group tends to be the 60 to 90 year old group. So we sort of have different healthcare issues in that group. So we wanna do this in a safe manner. See, last year there were 700,000 total joints done, a million total joints, including um, total hips, cost of 17, billion dollars, which is a big a chunk of the three a trillion dollar health care bill. This is ex expected to explode by 2030. The number of knee replacements is going to increase by 700 percent. So it's expected to be 3.5 million total knees done by 2030. The fastest growing group is the 40 to 60 year old age group. By number, it's still the Medicare group, but the, the steepest slope is in the 40 to 60 year old group, which was that uni compartment group I was just talking about. And there's a 3,000% projected increase by SG Squared, which is a major consulting group in the country that consults for insurance company and major hospital systems. They just revised their 10 year outpatient total knee growth projection from 178% to 3,000, yes, 3,000% 3, growth in outpatient total joints. So we better figure out how to do that correctly. We need to find cost-effective solutions that are safe. So this is really not a big surprise if you look at the, the natural evolution. Through my training, it wasn't unusual to be in the hospital for anterior cruciate ligaments for a three-day hospital stay. Arthroscopy, <coughs> um, rotator cuff spine surgeries, partial knee replacements were all inpatient procedures. Now everybody understands that those are outpatient procedures. So the total joint world in a certain percent of people will go to an outpatient procedure. Non-orthopedic cases, I mean, how many 
People remember gallbladders being a seven-day hospital stay, a big slice in your side. I mean, it was like a big C-section about a foot higher. It was terrible. Now you go home the same day through laparoscopic procedures. So this is a natural evolution. It is not that surprising. And if you look, the, the, um, the graphs have crossed a while ago in the last 30 years. Outpatient surgery all around um, outnumbers inpatient surgery by a, a large margin. Recent data shows that the cost is significantly less for total hips done as an outpatient versus inpatient. There's a seven to eight thousand dollar difference with no change in complication rates. So if you pick the right patients and it's cheaper without a higher complication rate, who wouldn't go that route? And if we're looking at 3.5 million total knees, we could save eight to ten thousand dollars on an outpatient, make it more comfortable, and there's no place like home. Who wouldn't? consider having that. Um, so they'd say, wait a minute, I want to be in a, I, the hospitals are safer. I don't, I don't like this home thing. You know, I want to stay in the hospital. But if you really look at the data, are hospitals really safer? <clears throat> Here's a journal of patient safety. Last year, almost a half a million people died due to preventable hospital errors. If you look at that number, that puts medical errors as the third leading cause of death in this country. It's crazy. So, you know, uh, hospitals are necessary, but they are not risk-free. Um, you know, if you're afraid of flying and you don't want to die in an airplane, what do you do? You don't fly. So if you want to die in a hospital, you just don't go there. But sometimes you can't help it. You need hospitals for some things. You know, if you go out here on 81 tonight and get in an accident and it's a major trauma, you need a tertiary care hospital. So. If you're a criminal that escapes from a jail up in northern New York and you happen to get shot near the Canadian border, they make a decision not to take you to the closest community hospital because the likelihood of you dying is very high versus um, transporting you to Albany, which is a couple hours away, but it's a level one trauma center. So then we can save your life and get you back to life in prison. So there's reasons, you know, to do, to do these things. So anyway, and so why would, you know, so all hospitals are not created equal and they, you know, they don't all have a high level of uh, errors. So our hospitals are very specialized. We're not everything to everybody. We have certain service lines and we're proud of our hospitals. Um, we do a certain, certain things very well. It's owned and controlled by physicians, so we're more accountable. We have more resources um, to target the things that we do well. Outpatient total knees um, compared with inpatient total knees on this chart shows that inpatient care, inpatient, staying in the hospital, you had a higher risk of infection and a greater risk of stiffness. And why is that? Because what lives in hospitals? Bacteria, you know, all the antibiotic resistant, the meth resistant staff. And it's, you know, it's a necessary evil. The sickest patients with the lowest immune system with cancer and liver disease and heart transplants. And it's just the nature of the beast. So the point is it's necessary, but if you don't need to be there, you don't need to be there for an arthroscopy or an ACL. And for a certain percent of patients, that need total joints in going forward, you're not gonna need that. So, but you have to educate yourself and figure out where you fit in that spectrum. So decision for surgery is not easy. It's appropriate when your hip or your knee is debilitating, your lifestyle is miserable, and all appropriate non-surgical options have failed. So what we have to do, what the patient has to do, what the insurance carriers require is for us to confirm their diagnosis, the type of arthritis, how debilitating it is to them, what they can't do, how many steps they can walk, how many blocks they can walk, how they go to Wegmans and use the cart to lean on like a walker, how they can't play with their grandchildren, they can't walk on the boardwalk, they can't go to Disney World, and then you sort of document all that stuff. And they have to have tried all this. This is important. It's part of our joint camp program because not only do you check all these things off, but we, it becomes part of your medical record so your insurance camp company doesn't claw back and say, wait a minute, 
which they're doing now. Medicare is doing this. They're doing retroactive audits of hospitals and physician groups going back three years and saying, well, you, you've done X number of total knees and total hips, but you know what? We look back and you didn't do all this. So they're actually clawing back from the hospitals and physician groups for Medicare money that was paid if this wasn't fulfilled. So this is important for both your insurance, your physicians, and your hospitals. You have to document which anti-inflammatory is over the counter or prescription. You've tried physical therapy, you've modified your lifestyle, you stopped doing uh, Zumba and lunges and CrossFit, and you've tried the cortisone and the hyaluronic acid injections. Either you don't want to or the cane or the walker no longer helps. You've tried braces and weight loss or you can't lose weight because your knees and your hip help hurt. So you gotta document all of that stuff. That's part of the joint camp. So it's almost this, this very easy program, and I brought one in, I don't think I have it in here, but um, we have a booklet that everybody gets, and we call it the passport. They take it with them from the time they decide to have surgery. They go home, it has all the slides of our joint camp. So if you say, you know, Dr. Mead, your PA was talking too fast, I have no clue what you said. It's all in that book to look at. Um, and you have a care partner that uh, goes through it with you. So everybody's experience is unique. So what predicts success? It's not one thing, it's a combination of patient factors, surgeon factors, and institution factors. So you have to get all these three lined up in this overlapping Venn diagram. And if you look at institutional factors, again, you don't wanna go to that upstate New York hospital for gunshot wounds. So you have to pick the right facility if you're gonna be shot with a gun. So if you are gonna have a total joint, you wanna look at dedicated facilities that have dedicated joint teams. And you don't know that, you know, unless you know nurses or people that work in a hospital and you sort of talk about that, you have no clue the percent, you know, the percentage of orthopedics that are done in this country, 80% of all orthopedic uh, joint replacements are done by physicians that do less than 70 a year. And so in their hospitals, they don't have enough volume to have dedicated teams and dedicated wards. So um, the staff isn't as um, educated. The cases take longer. The longer time when you're in the OR under anesthesia, the higher the complication rate. Um, and sometimes you don't wanna be in worse shape coming out than going in thanks to medical errors and dangerous infections. And that was in this year's consumer report. So the SWIFT PATH program that I'm part of, um, you have to have a high caseload because volume matters. So we don't, we don't allow surgeons in our program that don't have high caseload. They have to have specialty training in their area of interest, hips or knees. They have to have a dedicated team. They can't have a random team in a hospital. The patient has to be engaged in education, participate, in preoperative formal education, and then they're eligible for this rapid rehab. And the patient factors will get this passport. They have a care partner, a family member, a friend, somebody that is interested that goes to the joint camp, listens with them, hopefully takes them to the hospital. If they go home that day, they need somebody to drive them home. And for a couple days at home, they could use their, their help. So having a care partner to listen, another set of ears, carry that passport and understand you know, what was said is always um, helpful. We'll show you how you can pick your length of stay. Are you an outpatient, a one, a two, or a three day patient? And what's our discharge plan? None of this should be up in the air. So you're sort of jumping out of an airplane when you go and have a joint replacement. Say, hey, doctor said I'm having a joint replacement. I'm showing up at the local general hospital. And you go in and then you don't know the next step. You know that you're gonna have surgery, you have no expectation of what it's gonna feel like when you wake up in the recovery. Am I gonna have a lot of pain? Am I gonna be screaming? What do I need? I'm in the hospital, am I going home today? Am I going home tomorrow? Am I going home? Am I going to a nursing home? And so all those things need to be addressed beforehand. You should have a, a whole care pathway that you know beforehand. Um, everything needs to be coordinated. Here's the patient selection tool, which comes from Swift Path. So this, this picks your length of stay, and you fill that out. Patients come in and they fill that out in our joint camp. And you might come in and be scheduled for 
an inpatient stay, and you say, wait a minute, I think I fit the criteria for outpatient. If you're motivated, you understand it, you have a great family, your home is perfect, you, um, your age isn't a big issue. Um, neither of these factors, age or BMI, is an exclusionary factor. How close are you to a hospital if there's an issue? The modified Charleston index is just how many other medical conditions you have, and you have to pass physical therapy. We don't wait till after therapy to see if you can get up from a low toilet or get in and out of a car. You sort of have to figure that out ahead of time. And the way we've done that with SwiftPath is we put all of those criteria to a number and we come up with a score. So you score yourself on motivation and comp, do you understand it? Is Do you have great family? What's your home set up? Your age um, uh, can have a slight increased risk. Your BMI is all numbered here. We have a certain metric for each level. How close are you to a hospital? Do you have hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, asthma, COPD, um, peripheral vascular disease, sleep apnea? And did you pass the consult? And so that comes up with a number. You add this up, and there's a number that comes up. And it's pretty cool. If you hit 30 to 35, you win the outpatient award. So you can be done as an outpatient. And with this, this has been vetted in over 300, almost 400 cases. I've done 10% of those cases, and we have 100% people can't believe it when we tell other orthopedic surgeons we have a 100% non-readmission rate if you fit those criteria, which means we have a big safety margin in that group. So that is a pretty cool criteria. <laughs> We're actually gonna change this score to 100. We're just gonna sort of um, uh, multiply it up to 100 because people like numbers of 100 in, in a base of 10 instead of 35. So <laughs> basically if you get an A, you're, you know, it's, it's just, it just can't figure out those numbers. But, you know, it's like, it's like a curve in, you know, in college on a test or something. If you're between 24 and 29, it's surgical discretion. So there is a discretion, you know, if you fall into one of these, you have a super motivated patient and, you know, the numbers just come out. So there's always room for discretion. If you're in 20 to 24, you're a one night stay. And really, like I said, there's patients that have multiple medical problems and you want to keep an eye on them for two or three days and possibly send them to a skilled nursing uh, facility. So this is a tool and a metric which is very objective. It's not a subjective, well, let's put you in this hospital or that hospital. So it's pretty cool. Um, and the, the, the contraindications, if you have severe arrhythmias, pacemakers, um, you go in and out of atrial fibrillation or VTAC, if you're demented, untreated sleep apnea, bad, you know, bad stuff here, no family support. You don't want to do it. That's a critical part. A lot of previous surgery, stiffening. So there's a lot of reasons that we, that we eliminate people. And so what we focus on is multimodal pain management. What does that mean? Well, that means that there are multiple ways to give different types of pain medicine that work at different parts of the neural pathway. Narcotics that they give you work in your head, and I'm working on your knee, so all the pain goes up here, and there's no relief until they give you some narcotic that sort of acts centrally and it makes you a little wacky until you really don't care what you're doing. If you think of it, if you had a spinal or a regional block or some other block, just from a block standpoint, your brain never feels that. It's, pretty, it's sort of pretty interesting when we're in the operating room and if you, historically, if we did operations under general anesthesia, patients asleep, they don't know what's going on. You make an incision, all of a sudden their vital signs change. Their heart rate goes up, their blood pressure goes up. They're not awake and feeling it, but their body knows that they've been insulted. So they're getting pain mediators. So, so what happens at the top of the table? The anesthesiologist starts giving them narcotics to, because their body is sensing pain. It wants to bring the blood pressure down. Um, and through the whole case. Then when they wake up, they're sick to their stomach, they're dizzy because all of those narcotics that they were giving them to control the pain that the patient was unconscious was affected. If you actually did some sort of regional block and you make an incision, you know what happens to the vital signs? Nothing, they stay there because the body never knows it was insulted because the pain never gets up there. It's like a paralyzed person that it doesn't feel if you step on their foot. So anyway, but we'll go over a little bit more of the, the uh, multimodal pain management and how cool it is to start two days ahead of time. And we do this now for all our surgery. So anybody here, this isn't just for 
this isn't just for joint replacements. Any surgery that you're having can use some of these multimodal pain medicines um, before you have surgery if you sort of pass it by your surgeon. And we go over all this stuff, how to pre-rehabilitation your home setup, how to avoid blood clots, nausea, vomiting, how to pee afterwards. So here's what we do. One of the things we do is minimally invasive surgery, and it's not just the incision. Everybody goes, look at my incision. I have this little incision. You can have a little incision and a terrible job because they couldn't see in there, and you have it revised in three years, and that happened a bunch of years ago. Minimally invasive surgery is sort of a philosophy where you do the best job you can through the smallest possible incision, but it's more than just the incision. It's being gentle with the tissue. It can't look like hamburger when you're done. And we don't cut any tendons. We spread tissue like Venetian blinds. We don't dislocate the kneecap. We sort of evert it. One of the big things of minimally invasive techniques is not using a tourniquet. Historically, we used a tourniquet because it was easy for us. And what is a tourniquet? It's a blood pressure cuff on your limb. How many people get a blood pressure and you can't stand it for 30 seconds? You put that thing on, you're going, oh my god, take that off. You know, it's 30 seconds. It generates pain. In the sports world, we know there are studies done that if you put a tourniquet on a leg and do no surgery, just leave a tourniquet on for an hour, it will cause permanent muscle damage and EMG changes in that muscle for a whole year. And so then they go to the physical therapist and they go, oh, you got to get that quad going. You had all this swelling and surgery. No wonder the quad is turned off. The quad is turned off for multiple reasons, but one of them is the tourniquet. So we stopped using the tourniquet or we set it for less than five minutes just to make the incision when you have a little bit of bleeding. But after that, we don't use it. And that's amazing. They don't wake up with that quad pain that they sort of have. So that's part of this minimally invasive approach. It's not just the incision. Frankly, the incision is just one part of it. It's what we do. It's what we do underneath there. And so what we do is we just use a um, knife just for the skin, and then we use an electric artery or a bovi. And there are a lot of electrical devices out there, bipolar units, so that once we go through the skin, we never use a scalpel again. We use an electrical artery, so we carterize all the vessels as we're going in there. So you see them. If you don't do that, frankly, that's why we had a lot of blood loss. They would put drains in, you had blood coming out of the knee, they had reinfusion, because they didn't stop the bleeding. And then they wouldn't drop the tourniquet till the case was over, and that was sort of the, you know, the historical way that surgery was done. So a lot of these, a lot of these techniques, you, know, you just shake your head, and I'm you know, partly responsible, say, how can I go through my career and not figure some of this stuff out? Because we're so focused on what we do, and we're not focused on all the little things and how it affects the patient's experience and their recovery. So minimally invasive surgery is a faster recover, improved quad fu functions, because we don't use a tourniquet, we don't cut tendons, we don't avert the patella, less pain, smaller incisions, so you get better range of motion. And we've miniaturized a lot of our equipment so we don't have to make as big of an incision. The other thing we should do is change the name of this operation. It shouldn't, you know, knee replacements really started in the, in the, in some ways, the late 50s, early 60s. So they've been around for 60 years. What we do now has no resemblance to what we did 50 or 60 years ago. So when people come in, they say, well, geez, I don't want, I don't want a knee replacement. I say, well, we really don't take your knee out and give you a new knee. We should change the name of it. It should be called a knee resurfacing. All we're doing is replacing the cartilage. We're putting a crown or a cap on the end of the bone like a dentist puts a crown on to replace the enamel. And they go, you're kidding. I go, no. They go, I, well, I'll take that operation. I just didn't want my knee replaced. So it should be called the knee resurfacing. And that's where there is some confusion when we sort of go over that. And there's different degrees of bone resection that physicians, when they were trained historically, can do you know, bigger procedures. But what we do is we, we take off the cartilage. We contour it to fit the distal femoral component or the crown. And that ends up being half of the operation. So that's all it really is, is it's, a, it's an alloy on the end of the bone that replaces the cartilage, because we don't have biologic options or cartilage spackle to replace all of that. And then, like, like dentures, you need a bottom one on the tibia. This is sort of um, 
a little bit thicker than the one we use. All we do is take the cartilage off and replace it with a few millimeters of polyethylene. And people say, did you replace my kneecap? And I said, no, we didn't replace your kneecap. You have your kneecap. Your kneecap is bone and a cartilage lining. We take off the arthritic cartilage and replace it with a polyethylene button so it, doesn't, so it rubs on the uh, metal. But that's the confusion that is explained in the joint camp that a lot of people don't understand. So, and that's what it looks like when it's done. The traditional model of joint replacement, I love this. You know, when I was training, it wasn't unusual to be seven to 10 days in the hospital. You saw an orthopedic surgeon, you got scheduled at the big university or the general hospital, you went home, you packed your suitcase, your pajamas, your M&Ms, the, the Oreos, caramel creams, potato chips, you got the blanket, the book. Uh, the pillow, I mean, you were going away. So you went into, you were ready. I mean, you were, you were set for that hospital for the duration. And then you went in and they said, well, we better consult the hospitalist. We better consult, you know, the cardiologist. They order labs. All the meds are on pre-printed um, uh, orders so they don't have to write them every time. And now they're in the computer. So there's three pages of pre-printed meds that everybody gets automatically. Um, and that generates laboratory tests that generate more consults and more money and uh, more polypharmacy, et cetera. And then you have the surgery and then you don't get out of bed for a day or two because you had an indwelling epidural or a block that's your numb for three days. And so all these things historically increase your time in bed, your risk of DVT, your risk of uh, catching an infection. But that was the traditional model, the new model is you see your physician, you go to joint camp, you pick where you fit in that spectrum of length of stay, you go to a, a dedicated joint center or a hospital that has a dedicated orthopedic floor, and right now, um, 20 to 30% of patients are eligible to have this done as an outpatient. Um, the rest of them can be a 23-hour stay, and the exception should be a two-day hospital stay. So the swift path joint replacement involves multimodal pain management, minimally invasive techniques, and the patient selection. So 94% of total joints have no major complications. That's the group that we should concentrate on having rapid recovery, either outpatient or minimal hospital stay. We go to preoperative therapy like we talked about so you can learn all of this stuff ahead of time and you have to pass it. If you don't pass it then you can't and the physical therapist has to certify you pass it and send it back to the surgeon that said you know Mary Miller passed and and that's part of our outpatient protocol. Plus they go over all the other things so you hear about how to avoid blood clots and nausea and vomiting so everybody is speaking the same language.